This is an Inside Jerry's Brain call on Thursday, February 28th uh, at 11 a.m. ish Pacific time. And we are just checking in just to, to, to see what's on our minds map wise, otherwise, and uh, see where that might take us for an hour. And then I have to, I have to actually boogie at the top of the hour. So um, we'll see where that goes. Anybody care to start? I just have a personal question for Michael. Michael, I know on, in the past you've mentioned you've had some uh, issues with being able to stand and sit and walk, or some structural issues. How are you doing? Are you, are you any better? Are you still struggling? Or just... Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ken. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm actually laid down by a head cold today. It's, uh, so it's another onslaught on myself. As regards the, um, the polymyalgia rheumatica, PMR, you can look up PMR on um, uh, Wikipedia, comes just before PMS, which gives you some idea what you're really looking at. <laughs> and um, yes, it's, it's, it's handled by drugs, steroids help. Uh -huh. and I'm perfectly competent in most things these days. I even went skiing last week. So, oh, fantastic. Yeah, thank you for your consideration. I'm, uh, I have no excuses. C'est la vie. Thank you. La vie. Yeah. Sorry, that was a, when I used to live in Boston, there was a, a comedy troupe that would play at Faneuil Hall and Quincy Market. And one of their signature lines was, c'est la vie, and the whole audience would go, la vie. So. <laughs> I'm sorry we missed our cue on that. <clears throat> now you'll know for next time. Exactly. Hey, Reigns, how you doing? Uh, you are muted, we cannot hear you. And I assume we're supposed to guess where you're walking? Uh, you can try guessing. Uh, you're walking. You a big clue. Can you give us a clue? Us a clue? Somewhere Let's with see. sky. Clue yeah, something. One, which, is not, uh, which is ambiguous. Books, so there's a bookstore behind you. You're in a mall. A mall? An open air mall. An open air mall, yeah. Okay. So I didn't recognize the bookstore, and, and Rains lives in Berkeley. Time for a clue, too. Souls, oh. Saul's. Saul, oh, Saul's Deli. So you're in, you're in, uh, off, just off Shattuck. Absolutely. Gourmet ghetto. Fabulous. And just a couple blocks to your left is uh, Chez Panisse. Absolutely. Down that away. Brilliant. Uh, and, uh, and right in the um, Vine Street Collective, the Juice Bar Collective on Vine Street, which is closing after 42 years. Hmm. That's too bad. And the bookstore that was behind you went out of, I thought they went out of business. Amazing it lasted that long, really. That was, what was it called? Oak Books? Black Oak. Black Oak, yeah. Oh yeah, that, that book thing was a Black Oak. Yeah. Cool, nice to see you. We're just uh, checking in a little bit on mappy sort of things. Any, anything map-wise on your brain? Oh, he muted it. Uh, you are muted, which is fine. Sorry, I was going to be quiet to hear other people check-ins to then get in context. Sounds great. Thanks. Oh, Michael, you're in here twice now. Most interesting. And one of you is frozen. So <laughs> actually, like your evil twin just got spawned off. Yeah, that's the way. So, so are we supposed to now like play with our consoles and try to kill the evil twin? Please don't. <laughs> ah, okay, good. Oh, good. Now he's gone. How about that? Um, Robert, do you want to talk a little bit about any mappy puzzles you're, you're, you're playing with? Because I know you're, you're in the middle of multiple maps, so. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'm more looking for some sort of like, maybe sort of like a data interoperability layer or something that would sort of allow people to use the mapping tools that they use and still sort of federate their data in some way so that while I'm on my map, I might stumble upon uh, maybe something in your brain or something like that. Um, but really my focus recently has been on this open learning commons thing and sort of trying to sketch out um, sort of a suite of tools that this learning community can use together. One of which um, 
is on the top of my mind now is the federated wiki and trying to figure out what's the best way to sort of host that and then offer that to the community. And it's sort of a mappy thing. It maybe it's not as visual, but when you're down in, the, down in your wiki pages and sort of creating things, you can sort of think of each page as like a node on a map and the, the links between them as, as the edges or something. Um, so yeah, that's sort of been on my mind in, ter in terms of, oh, and the yeah, context there, uh, Ward Cunningham and, uh, hosts a, a weekly call on Wednesdays, and they are playing with something called GraphViz as a layer on top of Federated Wiki that lets you um, sort of see the bigger picture and click on visual nodes using GraphViz to sort of navigate, navigate the different pages within your Federated Wiki. And GraphViz is that uh, AT&T research visualization tool that sort of got deprecated and but there's a whole bunch of projects that have built on top of it. Yes, yes. I'm not super familiar with it, but um, both Ward and uh, David Boville seem to be sort of uh, power users of this. And as I said, they've sort of have created a plugin for Federated Wiki and actually Federated Wiki is has a lot of plugins. It's a very pluggable sort of system. And uh, uh, so yeah, they, they're trying to play with how to see the bigger picture. Um, and actually Ward exports, I guess he does like a web crawl of the entire federation or at least the entire Federated Wiki federation and mm -hmm. puts like a file that has every page on it. So you could potentially create a huge sort of graph visualization of the entire sort of Federated, federated Wiki universe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Have you looked at IdeaFlow much? Uh, I, I would have only seen it because I think you mentioned it and its creator on a recent call. Yeah, so I sort of Jacob. explored a bit, but uh, no, I haven't used it. I, I don't know how open it is. It's part, maybe part of the problem, but um, it, it's got funding and interest from Joey Ito. Uh, and it looks to me, it looks to me super powerful because to me, uh, GraphViz seems like a really antiquated tool. Uh, and maybe it's been brought up to date. I don't know, but but if IdeaFlow could be put to use around these things, it might be actually really helpful. Um, but I don't know. And, and uh, here's, here's Ward Cunningham's smallest federated wiki. Uh, and then uh, here's actually the GitHub for it. And there's a bunch of people who've been, who've been using uh, that, including David Boville, who has let me just bring him up. And then here's his federated wiki. And we were just learning about the Thought Garden federated wiki as well. So let me just connect this up to the smallest federated wiki. And then uh, we were learning just a little while ago on an earlier call today about team roles and wikis and uh, a project that David has called Storycraft, which is trying to do a deliberative discourse for large groups of people. Um, and let me actually connect Boville to this project. And there's another fellow named Hamid, I know Habib, who is involved here, whose last name I don't know. Uh, but I have that under collaborative storytelling. And it, it feels like a piece of what many of our conversations are around is some kind of collaborative storytelling and meaning making in order to fix stuff. I think that's maybe a reasonable, a reasonable paraphrase of just a whole bunch of our efforts here. It's like, all right, how do, how do we come together um, to make, you know, this the collaborative sense making thing. Uh, which is also a thick nest of, of nodes in my brain. So I'll bring that up. <laughs> I have too many things open. My brain is slowing down to a crawl. I mean, yeah. There we go. Boop. And then I'll stop screen sharing and see what anybody, what this provokes for anybody. So here's collaborative sense making. And then I have a project I call Open Global Mind. And one of the interesting nodes next to Open Global Mind is Open Global Mind Neighbor Communities, uh, which includes uh, IPLD, so uh, basically IPFS linked data, right? Interplanetary linked data is a, what I would call a neighbor community. 
And I, I think this, this quest that Robert just mentioned about how, how might we fashion an intermediate layer of trustworthy data in a reusable formats so that we could peek into one another's maps, reuse them, annotate them, yet still remember who put what in. I think that's a, a, a great ask and a great way to, a great way to go. Robert, does that resonate for you? And you're, yeah, there you go. Yeah, sorry, I was, you asked, I don't know, I guess I went a little too deep into trying to pull up other, other stuff um, That's right. that was on, on my mind recently. So I was off collecting those, but um, yeah, the other story threaders or other, I very much like this sort of role-based way of sort of thinking of how we might sort of create some sort of map looking digital artifact together. That's, um, I guess I, I call it federated because it's not exactly like anybody owns like the whole chunk of data. It's just, we, we all opt in sort of to sort of contribute our little piece and make it a little more open so that it can be discovered. And uh, the, I know you're aware of it, but this fits in with uh, the game shifting stuff, which is very role based and actually provides other potentials in terms of like on the zoom call, we could maybe have uh, on my screen or something like a, a little display board that might say like what mode the group's in and then, hey, I'm playing a weaver role or I'm playing some other type of role. So I, I very much like this sort of almost like a, yeah, a game thinking of it as a game or that we're all playing different sort of and, and um, for further context, I, I had a conversation with Jack Park just recently, and he has a project called Topic Quests. And this is also how, and it's very much overlines with what I'm trying to do with the Open Learning Commons is the, um, he, he described how he wants to create, or he's, he's creating a tool that's soon to be released that um, you can do sort of dialogue mapping with. So questions, answers, pros and cons, and you sort of map this all out, but he, uh, he thinks of it through this same gaming lens of uh, you're going on a quest together, you sort of pull together a guild of people and everybody sort of has their, maybe their stated role. Not, not exactly that like maybe you're not like the best at this role or like it's your top skill, but for now you'll take on this role and um, play, play in a certain way that like, yeah, maybe I'm listening for nuggets of, of information or trying to hold some perspective during a conversation and just offering as a service, maybe note taking or some other sort of other role. I'm adding that to OGM neighbor communities. And also um, a bunch of what Jack's work started as was how do I make an open source version of, of uh, Watson, IBM's Watson. So there's a bunch of quite ambitious sort of uh, AI type logic and question answering capacity that, that, that lies behind it. But he's also trying to pull together these, these quests. And I, I've been an, an advisor to kind of a quiet listener from the sidelines to Topic Quest Foundation for, for some time. I've known Jack for a long time. Um, and, these, and, and, I, and game shifting is Arthur Brock's thing. Arthur I know quite well. Um, Arthur I know really well. He's been a, a, one of two fellows for Rex for, uh, since 2010, um, and I've known him way before that. But um, we've got to be able to figure out which of these people to bring together because we're, we're sort of, I feel like the piece parts are sort of on the table. And we, we're, we're a couple of collaborations away from having some really interesting stuff um, show up. I'm just looking at the link that you sent. And Jeffy. The, the thing I'd say about game shifting is it's kind of a, a really cool sort of just open idea that's out there as a potential more so than a fully developed sort of well, it doesn't exist in a software product form. It's it's more of like a local sort of 
in the same room conversational thing with like little mini whiteboards or something, but it to uh, it's totally open as a potential to sort of develop further as some sort of software tool to augment a Zoom call or I guess maybe any, any call. Mm -hmm. And here I'll add something that's kind of maybe a pet peeve of mine, but also kind of an interesting piece of the puzzle, which is one of the reasons I stuck with the brain so long and that I love the brain is that I've got one brain file and I always feed this one brain file. I know other black belt brain users who have thousands of brain files. They're always opening a new one and going boop, 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 boop. Um, and I know others like Mark Trexler who have divided brain files on purpose because they sell access to them and they need to have sort of finite domains. I sort of get that. Um, but on the one hand, I find that starting fresh with every conversation, I find sort of fruitless or frustrating because it's like, well, shit, do we have to do the same thing again? And so that's one reason why I love always connecting into this larger thick context. But on the other hand, I know that connecting into the larger thick context is completely overwhelming to, new, to newbies often, not always. Sometimes they're like, oh, I, I, there's a little hook, there's a little anchor, I get it. And they sort of, they, they're a little bit like Annex Honnold and they can get like a finger grip where you don't see it, where you don't see a foothold, they see a toehold, and then suddenly they're off and climbing and you're good. Um, but mostly I think uh, in large measure, people are overwhelmed by really large contexts. But then there's this complicating factor that really large historic contexts tend to limit creative thinking and tend to channel your thinking into whatever the original structures were, which is, goes back to the conversation, Robert, that Christina and I've been having a couple times, which is, if you're going to bring a map to a community, do you give them a template? If so, what template do you give them? Because if this map is about food growing, then, and, it, and it's a basic assumption so that you're going to pour a lot of fertilizer and pesticide on a crop that you're going to plow heavily and sell through secondary markets to, you know, to ADM and whoever else, that's really different from permaculture, organic farming, uh, intercropping, uh, pesticide-free natural farming. Like, like the, my template would be completely different for those two things. One template would all be about how nature works and how, and, and how we learn from nature and bring that back and about monitoring healthy soil. The other one would be about market price of corn or soybeans tomorrow and whether we should plant all corn or all soybeans next year because here's, the, you know, here's what, what Wall Street analysts say about the, the projections on pricing and what the weather forecast informs those, you know, the, you assume those prices actually fold in, sophisticated weather models, et cetera, et cetera. I, I subscribe to a, a newsletter from Grow Research, G-R-O Research, and it's got stuff I never ever use, but I'm completely intrigued by, like, you know, Brazil's soybean market whacked by something or other. And you're like, oh, geez, you know, behind the scenes everywhere, there's, there's these markets and movements going on all the time that are like that. And, and so I say all this because what, what, is the, what is the just enough balance between, uh, so, so partly I say that because every now and then I think it's really beneficial to blow up your model and just start over and merely start over. And long ago when I first became a fan of Wikipedia, there was this question of, you know, should schools use Wikipedia? Should kids be allowed to look at Wikipedia, blah, blah, blah. My, my thing was Wikipedia is built on the Wikimedia engine. You can instantiate one for nothing, it's free tell a class how to use it and go tell them to use this thing to tell you all they, all they can learn about dinosaurs without copying out big parts of the Wikipedia. Just don't, don't go look at it necessarily, but tell me, tell me everything you know about dinosaurs. Use this tool to go fashion and, and, and craft some domain of knowledge. And in so doing, you'll hit the interesting problems of how do we represent a taxonomy or, a, or some other you know, way of, of organizing. All those things will just sort of show up naturally in the task of organizing and theirs will probably not be the definitive wiki on dinosaurs, but, but the mere task of figuring those, those little, hitting those intellectual uh, bumps is super useful and, and brings a lot of people way further into the community of black belt mappers and representers and systems thinkers, right? And, and those people might not be created if everybody were using <clears throat> fully fleshed out, really sophisticated models all the time. And yet every now and then you want to go see the really beautiful baked cake and see what, what does a pro do with this funny, like, you know, icing squirting tool. Oh my God, it looks like, like the Amazon jungle just, just came to life on a cake. Like, like that's, 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 it's, it's inspiring. It triggers different ideas, et cetera. Go ahead, Riz. 
Uh, just since you were mentioning constricting structures and permaculture design principles, I uh, had some links I tried to share in text, but got disconnected. So uh, I can uh, figure out by mentioning them here, they will get links. Um, awesome. Uh, so I, uh, first off, uh, Liberating Structures Conference in Seattle. Uh, I just got off the, the waiting list, so I'll be going. Oh, um, fabulous. Uh, that's a uh, week after next. Uh, Nancy White is doing the pre-conference immersion. So I'd totally forgotten that they have events. I think of them as the as the uh, the, the the website with interesting stuff, but I don't I don't think of them as having events. So I didn't even know about this, and I'm bummed. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I was late to the party myself. Didn't think I was going to make it in. Shoot. Uh, they are they are planning on doing some zoom connection to it i will share that out and totally invite the community in of course thank you very uh, much uh, originally i started talking to them could i come and help share it you know with if, if i couldn't get in as an official registrant and they wisely were saying let's do things that don't overcomplicate or take away from the in-person uh it, it, there's a lot there's a, a whole art art of facilitating online art of facilitating in person and you're trying to do that together in a noisy space with open space that would take a lot of either a lot of production work or a lot of other types of work. Yep. Uh, but but they are very much, of course, their work is all about bringing out to the world and sharing. So uh, that'll be there. Um, and there's um, a chance that I might get to stop in Portland on the way up. Uh, so if you're in town. Awesome. Me. Should be. Yep. Not going very far in the next little bit. All right. Uh, and uh, this is unusual for me. This is my first trip of the year. Uh, usually I'm more traveled by now, but um, yeah, uh, this uh, uh, this this weekend, um, I guess I could say liberating structures in particular. It's, uh, it seems to be a pattern language, uh, a whole way of, of approaching the design of facilitating yep. organizational development, and uh, I, I I I love that those those worlds. Exactly. Um, There's also the pattern language, the group works card deck. Yep. Which, which has, I think, some overlap with liberating structures. I, don't, I really don't know how much. I've connected them here in my brain. Uh, the, the, uh, there are definitely some people connection, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to finding out how much overlap and different approaches. Sweet. Um, then um, the Permaculture Design Deck, uh, Kickstarter project I supported just shipped. Uh, and uh, it's uh, like a 250-card deck. And when you say permaculture, many people think, oh, like dry garden, like, you know, uh, you know, don't put a lawn in. But it's, it's, it's a really deep uh, system of uh, many layers of thinking about nature design, social design, social justice, uh, future visioning, um, so many layers. And this design deck, I'm just starting to explore, but it's just, even just uh, looking at it, it's category, permaculture design deck. Mm -hmm. Um, I, which I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the URL, but uh, I will Kickstarter. find it shortly. Permature yep. designed it by Devin Sulkinson on Kickstarter. How about that? That's the one. That's great. Thank you. I didn't and, know about it. And, and even just the imagery for the, the, the categories. I love these kind of things because they help me a lot as teaching frameworks and presentation tools. And I'm looking actively for principles for design from trust. Mm. Well, th that's something that I'll be doing this weekend in San Francisco uh, through Authentic Relationships uh, training. Sarah Ness, who is oh. an Austin-based filmmaker, uh, did circling work, but she's evolved it into her own brand. Ness or Ness? N-E-S-S. -S. Huh. Um, she was uh, a filmmaker who uh, did a cross-country drive some years back to the film for a film to be titled The Year of the Co-op, which is yet to be completed. And uh, that's how I got to know her and, and, and her work. But uh, this is a newer venture and she seems to be doing a lot more in sort of the coaching facilitating development, authentic relationships uh, and uh, this authentic leadership workshop. And uh, of course, so, so much of that starts with knowing yourself and um, yeah, just processing dynamics. So yeah, um, that sounds I've, great. I've not explored it in depth, but uh, that's 
that seems like the right kind of tool set to bring to the table for this. Uh, uh, last, uh, there we go. Here's permaculture design. Yeah, I just love yeah. the images on it. Thank yeah, you. Beautiful. Good. Yeah, nicely done. Of course, that community has a lot of good artists. Uh, for sure. Um, and then lastly, uh, I touched on before, but I just wanted to bring it to the, to the surface. Uh, at the end of May, the uh, National Co-Housing Conference will be at the Hilton in downtown Portland. Oh. Um, May, uh, including pre-conference 28th to June 2nd, approximately. Uh, a lot of tours, a lot of uh, workshops, a lot of good stuff. Um, and uh, if anybody's considering registering, talk to me because I can organize, I'm organizing some group discounts out of our California network and plug people into that. But you have to buy, you know, several tickets together uh, to get that. Uh, but in any case, the um, it's uh, it overlaps with uh, the start of the village building convergence, the hmm. 12 day long celebration by city repair, in which lots of different neighborhood projects take place of uh, uh, getting out and people where painting streets, creating cob benches and community amenities, a portable tea house. They've got something that's really deeply integrated with the city of Portland, permitting these things and uh, perme permaculture design to community design. And they just put the groups through a lot of steps to have a good experience during it. And it's overlapping with the um, Global Eco Village Network of North America. Uh, the Jenna Alliance is rebuilding part of the Global Eco Village Network. Um, and uh, there are a number of those folks that are going to be in town. So we're actually casting about for a place to use as a base of operations, maybe somewhere we can do a, you know, a two week rental of a place that could host things as well as host people mm -hmm. um, and, and activities. And a lot of uh, just cool thinkers from all over may be coming together for that and plugging into these other events as well. Interesting. Uh, the, I think that the group that Robert and I are connected to is doing some, is trying to put together a proposal for the Jenna Alliance to do some mapping work. Excellent. We, we've done some preliminary work with Kumu at our last gathering in Arcasanti, and I'm playing with that with the um, Elders Action Network as well. Uh, I, I think I would be my, my fuses might all pop if I was using mind mapping at Arcasanti. That would be like I'd go into like a, a resonant vibration mode and explode. Uh, yes, although although it's kind of interesting, just the the, the whole dynamic of being at this incredible, moving, deeply connected to the Earth place, and then going inside and looking at screens. Yeah. Um, uh, it, 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 the, the dissonance is tangible, Fun, <laughs> fungible, one might say. Yeah. And by the way, I had, um, I had it turns out I have the uh, National Co-Housing Conference in my, in my calendar, but I had it down from May 30th to June 2. So I think uh, I think I just... I, I, I think that are, those are the official dates and there's some couple of pre-conference workshops and tours. Gotcha. Okay, good. Um, and then I was going to go, where was I just heading? Uh, Kumu, Mapping, Santi, Arcosanti, Jenna Alliance. I was just going to go to Arcosanti, yeah. Yeah. Never missed any opportunity to go to Arcosanti. It's uh, with Hale Soleri's passing, the foundation is really stepping up now. Uh, and uh, some young people are taking the energy and building community so that it's not just a bunch of people holding this a bunch of architecture and trust, but uh, it's people creating events and making it economically self-sustaining. Trying to make it yeah. go. Yeah. We stopped. It, 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 been... it, go ahead. Oh, last, last piece and I'll let, I'll, I'll clear the floor. Uh, I'll just comment on this. It's, um, they, uh, they're, they're at a point now where it's sort of self-stable, but, you know, to go to the next step, they need to have, you know, uh, roads upgraded so they can host larger capacity events and uh, for fire safety people being concerned, the ambulance people want to be able to drive in quickly, mm -hmm. uh, not the bumpy road. But, uh, but it's sort of, the real issue now is that people who've been there a long time have the best spaces. And so people who are newer there and maybe starting families uh, are having, are being, it's hard to make room for them. So it's, a, it's like we're looking at the development of senior co-housing to create more space for intergenerational families. That's a similar dynamic here. How can you attract new workers and get them to stay unless you help create better housing options for the seniors there so they'll free up their spaces in the core of the community and new workers can come in and it can grow to the next level. Have you read Walk Away? Um, 
Uh, I uh, have I actually read it? No. Cory Doctorow's uh, book. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I know Cory, and um, I've uh, read a lot about it without actually reading it. I think. So the premise of Walk Away, everybody at Arcosanti should go read Walk Away, and then go talk to some three D fab people, um, because in, in in Walk Away, basically. Uh, there's the normals who's, who've remained in cities, but, but society has collapsed, cities are very dysfunctional. Yes. And a, a lot of people have walked away into uninhabitable areas, but because you can upload all your plans to the cloud, and because fabbing is really easy and cheap, you can go someplace and make a little village exactly the way you want it, including a Japanese uh, spa, uh, including you know, all the different working parts. And then if somebody comes and attacks you, you can walk away from that and just go do it again only a little bit better because as you were setting this one up, you thought of a nicer design and you improved it, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is completely utopian, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? So was Arcosanti. And, and I, I, I'm, in, I'm sort of intrigued by your statement that, you know, the, the, the oldest people have the, some of the nicest real estate. They're really stuck trying to expand this thing. And of course, always there's the business model. But, but it's, it's sort of ironic that they're, that they're stuck in a crusty, half-finished Arcosanti when if all this stuff came to fruition, <clears throat> they could be expanding into uh, quote, uninhabitable you know, land uh, and make it work. They're not very far off the freeway. I'd, I'm surprised the road is a problem because there's, uh, there's a bumpy road, but it's, you can see it from the freeway. Sorry, fantastic. Yes. Um, uh, uh, yeah, but it, but it is. Is that Betsy? An issue. Yeah, Betsy, can you say hi? Because I'm going to drive. Hi, uh, Betsy. Berkeley friends on wheels. No, no, we were talking about uh, Arcosanti, but hi. I will transition to Betsy because she has interesting things to share. This is a, oh. uh, a time of sharing what's oh. cool and what we're up to. Oh, wow. I'm sorry I missed what everyone else is up to. Here we go. Tell me what you're talking about. Uh, we were checking, well, so the, the, the context of the whole call is I've got a series of, of calls called Inside Jerry's Brain, uh -huh. which, which is meant to be a tongue-in-cheek explorations of whatever's interesting to us with a little bit of visual context around it. Okay. I and, definitely... Yeah, and, and this call is a no-context call. There's no particular topic. It was just a check-in because I haven't had a call in, a, in like two weeks. And, uh, and Reigns was just pouring delightful things into the conversation uh, from events that he's going to and uh, where you've been and a bunch of other stuff. So I was looking things up and curating that into my brain as, as we were sitting here talking. Well, I can, I can share on, uh, on the sustainable communities front here in uh, Berkeley where I've been diving deep into more of the city discussions and planning for both uh, disaster planning, which is now emerging to be a more urgent issue here. Resiliency. Resiliency. Um, the city staff has always had plans, but it's now needs to be a more community conversation. Uh, and, the, and the city emphasizes uh, helping blocks of neighbors get to know each other so that they can be stored for supplies for at least three days after a major earthquake or, uh, or, or something that might shut systems down. So in that vein, we're now, you know, kind of the class struggle here in Berkeley has amplified around enormous housing displacement and rising rents at a tsunami of displacement is the term used in Oakland. Uh, wow. So we have a debate when I heard you talking about the road, I thought you might be talking about where Today at the city council, there's a special meeting about the right the, the, the people who are living in vehicles. There's 1,300 people on the streets, but 200 are living in vehicles. And, uh, and the plan from the new city council member, who is deeply backed by the real estate industry, I just have to say, um, is to uh, uh, basically allow people to register for two weeks of uh, permitted parking once a year. So Whoa. this is like so absurd. Whoa. Absurdly is basically a, a right now you can park there and you move every three days, but uh, you know, it's upsetting neighbors if but they're in an industrial district uh, and there's a lot of issues. The city could use funds that they're allocating elsewhere uh, to provide sewer to provide uh, garbage pickup you know, like you do on a residential street, they could 
they have the power to turn this into a campground for emergency shelter. I mean, every, every city, <laughs> you know, that's thriving on one hand is doing this displacement thing where now rents, half of all renters uh, pay uh, more, than, more than what's considered affordable, but that includes 30% who are paying half of their income or more for rent. So I'm yeah. ranting a little. But the connections solutions. are very deep and the solutions all come back to uh, creating varieties of what you know as, as tiny home villages, as co-housing, mm -hmm. enabling people both to have, to be private parking campers, if you want to call it that, uh, or and creating blocks of land where 20 or 25 people can share uh, utilities. And actually, my take on this is we need to learn how to live more lightly and people who are already living more lightly using less carbon, right now they're in miserable conditions on the street. But there's people who would like to live in small homes with the, with the, the challenge of, of using solar and being net zero energy and greenhouse gas. And the, uh, you know, we have a movement of movements that could come together with, if we were just a little more creative and tweak the laws just a little bit. So I'm excited about you know, bringing those examples forward, trying not to get overwhelmed by my own outrage. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of allies. It's very exciting. But thank you. It's still a battle. Thank you. It's really cool. Thank you. One random question, which has always like been in my head around the East Bay, the, the old Alameda Naval Naval Base is a giant giant piece of real estate <laughs> that's paved over. Yep. I don't know if it's a super fun site, but why has nobody done anything around low income housing there? Uh, well, there is there is some, but keep in mind that again, the real estate industry, which many of us make a good living in, is like the oil industry. I'm sorry, it's entrenched. So mm -hmm. they do not want it to be affordable housing, and the little bit that's been allowed there uh, is is there. But the majority of the political interest is how to make a killing on that land if you built luxury housing. There's also cleanup issues. Yes, there are still cleanup issues. And there's also that Alameda for decades uh, uh, did not allow multifamily housing to be built. Only uh -huh. single family. Now still, that still doesn't by citizen initiative. Yeah, yeah. but it, it, it does. It, it's got more pressure to, to allow multifamily housing. I think that bill, that ordinance was struck down as unconstitutional or illegal. No. No, Interesting. It's, it's, but it's still, it's a, it's a town that doesn't, that has a strong resistance to multifamily housing, yeah. as does Walnut Creek and many affluent suburbs. This is why we're in a housing shortage. So just a, this is a note to Robert and me heading back toward conversations later with Christina Bowen, who's the Kulu, uh, Kumu black belt mapper and a bunch of initiatives that we're working on. Uh, the food nexus is a strong pull for what to map and, and how to help communities. But I think <coughs> everything you're pointing to just echoes how strong housing is, uh, and that and that network maps uh, or influence maps or whatever kinds of maps of this housing nexus might be useful in those conversations. And what what could be interesting is just to ask you guys, like if you could envision maps that would be useful, what would that those maps be of, and what would they work like? How would you how would they be used as boundary documents or as conversational artifacts that would help? Well, convince people of things? Well, I think the convincing is more on the lines of who's going to be my neighbor. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that the there's an excellent uh, uh, food atlas that was produced up at Cal, I don't know, almost a decade ago. But for example, it mapped every parcel, every publicly owned parcel in the city of Oakland that was vacant or radically underused and that had a flat enough, uh, was close to water access and power, and was flat enough to allow farming. And there were over, uh, over a thousand acres of this land. And right now there's no protocol to allow uh, urban farming, let alone considering uh, farm worker housing. The truth is that with a very tiny homes, you could have a dozen worker, I'm putting it in quotes, worker housing uh, and, and have an urban farm. 
Yeah. And also, so like, no reason we couldn't do both. It's, and verticality doesn't have to be an object because they've got wall farms and a whole, and the terracing is well known. And, you know, sure. you it's, can do a lot of stuff with, with, with scraggly terrain. Yeah. yeah. But in this case, this is vacant land that is prime for spin farming. I mean, we're not talking about giant crops with tractors. Spin stands for uh, small plot intensive. Yeah. It's been widely promoted as a, a great way to do intensive Urban. livelihood generating uh, small plot intensive what small plot intensive spin spin what's yeah small plot intensive farming. oh that the intense the n is from uh, intensive intensive yeah it started with a guy in canada and he's worked he's given talks and promoted it i don't see it a lot but it's 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 the best way to actually make a viable business Mm -hmm. urban farming rather than community gardening but all of those plots could have caretaker quarters you could you could easily uh have dozens of tiny homes <laughs> well thousands mm -hmm. if you added up all the plots so it's Super complementary to urban farming yeah, yeah and i gotta i have to go and uh, i'd love to share more and i'm always glad to take a peek in your brain nice thank to you. See that, you all. that was super helpful i really appreciate it Um, and I'm going to have to leave at the top of the hour. So uh, that was a lot of stuff. Anybody, Ken, go ahead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was listening to Betsy talking about people want to live, you know, with a lower carbon footprint. I was reminded of this article I recently saw that uh, I threw into the chat window about the, the challenge with putting the focus on individuals to change carbon footprints when there are, a, you know, a dozen or there's like 25 companies responsible for this enormous amount of pollution and, and carbon output. So um, while I really applaud everybody who's trying to lower their footprint, I think it's, it's not even a drop in the bucket compared to turning off the fire hose. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing that comes to mind is reading a lot about the Green New Deal. I would really love to see that mapped out, particularly with regards to some of the, the ancillary things that it touches on, like homelessness, like, you know, like small scale urban farming. Um, it feels like it's it's a great framework that we had some really nice visual maps for could really help mm -hmm. people understand what's going on because it's right now, you know, it's under attack from from uh, the status quo and and I, somebody it's not me because I don't have this capacity but if if there was a group of people willing to sit down and map out this stuff and give it some really nice infographics, I think it really would gain that would be a very useful tool for a general public conversation about what are we actually looking at here. Mm -hmm. Super interesting, um, and it, very timely. Like that, was something something like that that was quite useful would get a lot of attention from somebody these days. Um, and I'm I was when I started reading the Green New Deal uh, documents, I was kind of struck by it's much more it's much more about the New Deal and the welfare society and the and the, the larger things than it is about green development. I mean, there's a slice of it that's about green. Mm -hmm. But really, it's we're going to have free college, a whole bunch, you know, a meaningful uh, base income, all that kind of stuff. So it's it's a series of gigantic uh, social programs, which which I was like, ah, man, because there's because there's a huge opportunity to find common ground with greening, mm -hmm. I, and I, th I think that's that's a much easier um, slice of all this to take. So anyway, I, and I think mapping the issues would make that visible. In, in, in useful ways. Anybody else with thoughts? Um, yeah. <clears throat> Last week, I gave a symposium some webinar thing on uh, uh, money, currencies, and the like. I put a link in the chat. Um, and it worked pretty well. And the group that I did that with, the re-economy practitioners, or some people from the re-economy practitioners, we're going to um, see if we can germinate um, a little think tank on dig life um, through the um, Roberts Open Learning Channel as a starting point. Um, basically, to start a sort of populist education process around money. There, there's a lot of elitist education about money, of course, but uh, something that people get their heads around easily and act on is in a different category. Um, specifically, I, I was dealing with the issues of we need circular economies, and that means circular money, what is circular money, and then third part, how do we propagate it? And in closing on the loop, 
I was introducing the idea that banks could be using community money or providing community money services for their um, existing customer base very readily. Um, I mean, after all, a bank could run a time bank. For sure. So it could also run a business to business network. It could run um, let systems. It could run anything you like without touching its um, financial regulations because all of this is just um, chatter by its membership and there is no liability to the institution involved. So um, I was, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. That's about it. Um, I was just going to say, I was trying to talk people at the design firm where I'm sitting right now into pitching things like that to a local banking institution as early as like a year and a half ago, which is nothing like the 20 years you've been proposing us. Um, but I, I think the ideas are hard for them to, to, to seize on. So, I, I, yeah, it, it's definitely difficult for people to get their heads around this, particularly the, the institutional heads. Mm -hmm. I mean, 37 years, actually, Jerry. Mm -hmm. There you go. See, I knew I was undercounting. And when we first began with the LET system, we went to the credit union movement um, in British Columbia. And pointed out that they could do this. They could implement local currencies in all of their branches. Mm -hmm. um, but they argued back that there was one mainframe running 60, 70 entities, and they couldn't allocate any programming time to it until a whole bunch wow. of Wow. Wow. Well, that was that's reality in those well, days. Well, that was then. Yeah, exactly. Well, and then later, I, I've eschewed going that route because I've had so much difficulty with the, the, the the institutions. You, you try and get in through their channels, their um, policy bunch, their marketing, there's no hope. Mm -hmm. But if instead you can get in through their customers and through their staff as uh, an idea virus and propagate the potential for these ideas in that community, then um, I think we can get them. And there was a big conference in Vancouver last week from um, the Van City Credit Mm. And a bank in, um, oh, Van coach. City would be an interesting vector, huh? Because they're famous. They're 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 huge and and interesting. Uh, a thing I learned years ago. I got to talk to the founder of the Internet Credit Union, which was a spin out of the Internet Archive uh -huh. that, Bruce, that Brewster Kale runs. <clears throat> and they they got it. It turns out you can start a credit union very easily. Yeah. Um, that that sort of. Bring, getting it up and running is simple, and that almost everybody, I don't know whether everybody, I don't know if Van City does this, but almost everybody uses QSO software, credit unions, service operations, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they're all completely, and the QSO software is almost immovable, is, is, like, is like fixed and static, and everybody's afraid to touch it or change it, lest it be unapproved by regulators. So right. innovation in the credit union business is basically zippity doo -dah. Um, because of this barrier, and and I'd, I would I'd love to know what Van City has done if it's different because they're big enough that if they did something you know unique and different and, and and started layering currencies into this, they could change the game. Yeah, I I I, th I think there would be more than the software would be a problem for their process in that, but. Uh, if they just provide a gateway to a portal, uh, a, a portal to our API, mm -hmm. don't have to touch their software at all. Mm -hmm. And that's the route where we'll be recommending. Interesting. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Van City itself is, is a very interesting organization in that it's probably the biggest credit union in Canada. Reigns is home. Ah. <laughs> um, but that makes it the most uh, pretentious, the most rig rigid, the most uh, complacent of all of them. And um, therefore, uh, you need some fairly armor piercing yeah. munitions to get to them. Interesting. Uh, small note on emergency supplies. Uh, in San Francisco, April and I lived in a place that probably would have been one of the first to tumble in an earthquake because it was brick and not that well reinforced, although the pilings were reasonably sturdy, but who knows, it would have prob probably gone down. But I was like, even stockpiling a couple days worth of water was hard, was really hard. Like I bought a bunch of jugs of water and it's after a while you're like, well, okay, after six months or a year, they're gonna taste like plastic anyway. And then one or two of them just 
sprang leaks and emptied themselves, you know, spontaneously on their own, et cetera. And that was just water. And like, we didn't have a lot of spare closet space. And if we did, it was space that would be crushed when the building went down, right? So there, there was no safe domed place for a bunch of neighbors to share a bunch of, that didn't exist. There was no, so, so and if you had a really great stockpile and, and everybody else got wind of it, you'd be fighting everybody off from the stock. Like the issues on this are multi-layered and pain in the butt, like really complicated. Yeah, well, that's going back to what Betsy was talking about in terms of res community resilience, getting to know your neighbors. Some people have more space than others. You can, you can rent a pod, you know, those pods and, and stockpile it with blankets and food and water. And you know, I have old milk crates and I buy milk, bottle, you know, uh, milk jug, one gallon plastic milk jugs. And every six months I dump them in my garden and I refill them and put them in there. So it's never more than six months. And, you know, but it right. is hard. And, but our fire chief said, you know, there's no way. People said, oh, well, after three days, they'll come around with food and water for you, right? And he's like, who? Who's going to yeah, come around with exactly. water? You know, you are on your own. Oh. So, you know, and the other thing is don't make it all tuna fish and sardines. <laughs> chocolate in there because after a couple of 10 days of eating tuna and sardines, you don't want something you really want. So, you know, but it's, it's hard when you live in a, a place where you're subject to emergencies like that, fires, floods, earthquakes, all of which we get around here, you know. Yep. to stock up and, and be prepared. Um, Which is why the community side of this makes so much sense. Like absolutely. Getting, getting everybody up means that there's something everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, must, I must boogie. Um, thank you, everybody. Totally appreciate this. Good Rain, you, you have poured goodness into the call. Thank you for showing up. Yep. And... Uh, uh,